Reading 67 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Uspinsky by Dr. Maurice Nichol. Volume 3. Great Amel House, February 22, 1947. On Realizing That One Is Not Conscious On one occasion, Mr. Uspinsky was speaking of the various attempts made by the conscious circle of humanity to raise mankind to a higher level of being. He said in so many words, But for the work done on mankind by conscious men, we would be nothing but barbarians. Always behind culture is the threat of barbarism, and always conscious men are sowing at intervals influences into the world to lift man above the state of barbarism. These efforts take different outer forms and can only be given at times, but always are the same eventually. He said, G. had spoken of teachings in the past based on faith, on hope, and on love. G. had said, All these systems have had their influence on mankind at different periods of history. Faith, hope, and love have all been tried. But if you were to ask me about this system, I would answer you by saying that it is based on consciousness. In this system that I teach, the emphasis is not on faith, or hope, or love, but on consciousness. For this reason, I begin by saying that man is not yet conscious, although he believes he is. He believes he is conscious. He believes that all he does and says is done and said in a full state of consciousness. But this is not the case. Western psychology, as contrasted with Eastern psychology, starts from the idea that man, as he is, is fully conscious, and that there is no further state of consciousness possible for him. This is where Western psychology is at fault. A man, as he is, is not fully conscious. What he calls consciousness is not in any sense, consciousness. From the standpoint of the system that I teach, man is in the illusion that he is already conscious, whereas actually he is in a state of sleep and he lives his whole life in a state of sleep. At some other time, G spoke of hope as a basis of teaching. People, he said in so many words, may base themselves on hope, they hope for afterlife, or they hope that some promised Messiah will come and do everything for them. But they do all this in a state of sleep. They do not understand that all real teaching about man and his possibilities refers to the actual state of man now, as he is, and what he can become, and not to some future state or some eventual progress. For that reason, if you ask me what this work promises, I will answer you by saying that it promises nothing. A man must begin by realizing what he actually is now. He is not yet conscious. When he sees this, he must begin by remembering himself. If a man could remember himself, he would be at a higher level of consciousness. He would be no longer asleep. As a result, Many illusions would fall away from him, and everything would appear in a new light. If he went on, he would reach a state of consciousness above that of self-remembering, the state of objective consciousness. In that state, he would see things as they really are. He would then be awake a man can merely hope for objective consciousness, but hope will not give it him. He has to work on himself, here and now, and not hope that he will be given it in some other existence. So this system promises nothing. But if a man works, 
he will get something. Let us say he will receive leather with which to make shoes. But he must make the shoes himself so that they fit him. They must be his own shoes, not borrowed shoes. Let us speak today about not being properly conscious. You know that it is impossible to understand the work without doing it. One hears that one is not properly conscious and hears it again. One may then think that one knows all about that matter. Yet one understands absolutely nothing about it. Why? Because one has not observed and so seen for himself that one is not properly conscious. Here, a curious state exists. One still has the illusion that one is fully conscious and says and does everything consciously and behaves consciously at every moment. And then, one hears from the teaching of the work that one is not conscious. The two teachings lie in the mind without arousing just what should be aroused in oneself. This happens because a person does not apply what the work teaches to himself or herself. People just listen to the work and nod their heads. They may hear it a little, but it is necessary to hear and do the work. When by uncritical observation of yourself, instead of this heart-rending, continual, critical observation of others, you notice that you speak without being really conscious of what you are saying, and all the rest of it, you begin practically to realize that you are not properly conscious. You see the truth of the work internally. If the whole world were properly conscious, all wars, political lies, and so on would cease. Can you catch a glimpse of what it might mean to live amongst more conscious people? Can you see why you cannot? Can you see that an increase of consciousness, which is the goal of the work, and which begins by making yourself more conscious of yourself to yourself by self-observation, would lead to an entirely different life? Here, for instance, you always get offended or hurt or in a rage or depressed because of a constantly recurring, trivial situation. Others will tell you that you always mechanically, that is, not consciously, behave like that. But you won't believe it. You will justify yourself. In other words, you will refuse to become more conscious of yourself, of what you are like. Once we see for ourselves a thing recurring in ourselves through the inner sense of self-observation, we are gradually freed, gradually made less and less under its power. Why? Through the increase of consciousness. All increase of consciousness renders mechanical behavior less dominating. Consciousness is light. Mechanicalness is darkness. Things happen in the dark that cannot happen in the light. Self-observation is to let a ray of light into all that which we take for granted, namely, the illusion that we are fully conscious and always behave consciously. What an illusion! Can you think of a greater one? Now, as regards doing this work and not merely listening to it, to do this work requires effort. Only people make a great mistake in thinking. For example, that effort means that they should get up earlier, or dig all day, or give up smoking and all that. Effort in the work is psychological. It is all about not identifying and self-remembering. Effort in the work is all about observing oneself, observing eyes in oneself, and not going with them. Effort in the work is about being sincere to oneself, and so knowing what one's motives really are and not pretending. Effort in the work is about remembering oneself and not becoming at every moment identified with everything and everybody. Effort in the work is to stop inner talking. 
effort in the work is not to let negative impressions fall where they mechanically would fall. Effort in the work is not to pile up internal accounts against others, but to try to see in yourself what you blame in others, as, for example, unkindness. All effort in the work is passive. Self-development starts from passive dough. Effort is something very quiet and deep and clearly seen. It is not noisy, not pretense. It is not contracting muscles and thrusting chins out. Effort in the work is about effort on your inner states, where you are in your psychological country. All effort in the work is about becoming more conscious of yourself to yourself. All effort in the work is about seeing where you are inside, in what place internally, in this vast psychological country, and separating yourself from the innumerable bad places in that country. Remember that to move away from a bad inner state is only possible by non-identifying. An ordinary mechanical man or woman is totally identified with his or her inner state at each moment. A person who begins to work begins by knowing what it means to non-identify with the bad eyes that inhabit these states, those eyes in you that live in slums. He then begins to know what the work means and therefore what can lead to change of being. If you believe in all your states and moods and thoughts and feelings, if you say I to all your eyes, then you are totally identified with yourself and so are not properly conscious of yourself. To be conscious of a state, to observe it, means you are not that state. This is the secret, the first secret of esotericism. Yet people say, how can I change my being? Hear and do the work. Do and practice what it teaches on yourself. Then you will get gradually to another level of being. So think what practical work is clearly taught in this work. Begin with what the work tells you to begin with, and so do not keep asking, what shall I do to change my being? The work tells you how to begin, but have you ever thought of following it practically, of actually doing it now? The subject of this work is not the blackboard, it is you yourself. You are the subject of the work. How many times have you been negative today? And how many times have you noticed it and not identified with it? Have you lifted yourself even once today out of your mechanical moods? Even an act of noticing a negative state, of observing that you are negative or speaking negatively, separates you a little. Sometimes this moment of self-observation will change you for the moment completely. A sufficient number of such work moments may change you not for a moment, but for all your life. Nothing, said Mr. Uspinski, is more easy and more useless than to be negative all day long. People get negative, say, because life is not going as they think it should. If they only understood they would know that life is going in the only way it can and that nobody can do. This realization might help them. Of what use is it to expend all one's energy in being negative about life when it is all happening in the only way it can happen? This is sleep. Sleep.